All right, so with that, it's my pleasure to introduce to you today um, our speaker and one of my fellow course organizers, Dr. Eric Green. Eric, as many of you know, is the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute here at the NIH. Prior to his appointment uh, into the directorship, he was the um, scientific director of our intramural program uh, dating back to 2002, and I had the pleasure of serving uh, in the role of his deputy during that time. He was also the founding director of the NIH Intramural Sequencing Center, a uh, state-of-the-art DNA sequencing facility that has played a really critical role in the advancement of genomic science, particularly in the area of comparative genomics, and you're going to be hearing a lot about um, that uh, throughout this particular series. During the almost two decades that Eric spent directing his own research program, he and his group made major contributions towards our understanding of the human genome, having had significant involvement of, in the sequencing of the human genome since the very beginning of the Human Genome Project, and then having developed technologies and strategies for the large-scale analysis of vertebrate uh, genomes, providing us with uh, interesting and seminal insights about genome structure, function, and evolution. Because of his work in the field of genomics, Eric's received numerous prestigious awards and recognition and has been inducted into both the American Society for Clinical Investigation and the Association of American Physicians. Uh, today, Dr. Green will be presenting his perspective on the current genomic landscape, uh, thereby setting the stage for many of the topics we're going to talk about throughout this series. Uh, as those of you who have had the opportunity to hear Eric lecture in the past, you know he's an absolutely wonderful speaker, and I'm sure you'll enjoy today's talk very much. So with that, please join me in welcoming my longtime colleague and today's lecturer, Dr. Eric Green. Well, thank you, Andy, uh, for your kind words, and uh, let me may add, add my own welcome to all of you for the kicking off of this 12 series. Andy and I started this on just a brainstorming idea back in 1995. Can't believe how long that's been. Um, but uh, Tira and Andy are being kind to give me any credit for organizing the current series, believing they did all the work uh, for this. Uh, but I have been involved in lecturing in this series now um, all 12 times. And it's interesting that every time I go to prepare my new lecture, I, you'd think I would just say oh, it was only 18 or 24 months ago. But they gave the lecture not much more to add, and it always strikes me as truly remarkable how much uh, new material uh, I need to add. Um, although there's a lot of foundational stuff to always include, there's always so many new developments when you go to paint the landscape of, of genomics with such a fast-moving uh, field. Um, my assignment was to give sort of the genomics landscape with a current view of it. I will admit it's going to have a heavy emphasis on human, so I'm really going to mostly emphasize painting the human genomics landscape. Before we get into that, I should remind you, and you might imagine, I'm an institute director, so I'm financially quite boring. I have no relevant financial relationships with any commercial interests, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so in painting uh, what is a very, very vibrant landscape, um, what I'm going to try to do now for about the next hour and 10 minutes or something like that is really to cover a number of areas. First, I want to set a historical context for genomics. I then want to talk about the major achievements that have taken place uh, since the end of the Human Genome Project, which will allow me to then really describe the human genomics landscape, in particular the way I think it is, looks like now and, importantly, um, into the future. The other major goal of my lecture um, in painting this landscape, which is why they asked me to kick this off, is that I am going to try to place every single future speaker in this series into a broader context uh, within this landscape. And I will name every speaker and tell you exactly where I think they fit in and will expand upon what basically I only have time to barely touch. So with that in mind, uh, let's just launch in. And if you're going to paint a vibrant landscape, you certainly might imagine that there was a lot, a lot of brilliant work that took place before any of this could ever be crafted. And indeed, I would say that there are some major foundational milestones and some real iconic figures that really helped facilitate the growth of genetics and genomics uh, as disciplines that we know today. Uh, I could probably spend two or three hours talking about this, but just to briefly summarize, you'd have to sort of name Mendel as one of the key uh, players in this, uh, really understanding some of the basic uh, rules and properties of, of inheritance. Clearly, Meissner, when he discovered DNA as a molecule, uh, clearly deserves credit for, for helping to facilitate the growth of this, of this field. And then, of course, there was Avery and co-workers who did all those weird experiments by taking uh, bacteria and boiling them and not boiling them and injecting them into mice and see, figure out exactly which ones 
um, exactly uh, would, would cause uh, uh, infection and death, and therefore figured out that DNA was almost for certain the, the inherited material that was so important. And that then set the stage for what took place in the 1950s with Watson and Crick's discovery of the double helical structure of DNA. Uh, shown here is that Nature publication, arguably the most significant publication of the last century, um, at least in terms of the biomedical research arena. The double helical structure of DNA really provided the last piece of the puzzle that existed to really make us understand how it was that DNA could be the information molecule carrying this information from one cell to the next and one generation to the next. And we understood its structure. We therefore could understand its properties for carrying on as an information molecule. Brilliantly, that set up in the 1950s a set of studies that then carried over to the 1960s to begin to untangle how it was that DNA actually functioned. For example, that led in the 1960s to the elucidation of the genetic code, something featured here on this campus by the work of Marshall Nuremberg, um, and really leading to a Nobel Prize for him and others, and really provided us the key insights about how it was that DNA encoded information for then making proteins, and therefore the genetic code and the lookup table that all of us learned about in intro biology became key to our understanding about the role DNA had played in encoding information for proteins. This later, of course, led to better and better technologies for studying DNA. In the 1980s, of course, one needs to credit being sort of the molecular biology revolution where DNA cloning came to be. Certainly that's when I was a graduate student and a medical student, for example, and that was the rage, learning how to manipulate DNA in the laboratory, learning how to clone DNA, and of course, learning how to sequence DNA and improve on that sequencing that was so key for being able to now be able to study DNA in the kind of exquisite detail that we wanted to. This, of course, laid the foundation for beginning to look at our ability to comprehensively study our own DNA, human DNA, as well as all of the DNA of an organism, which, of course, is its genome. And actually, one thing I thought was interesting, and I've reflected back on this in recent months, was I've now been involved in genomics for about 25 years. I started literally about a year after I graduated with an MD-PhD degree, and, I won and that was 1987. And I wondered, why is it that in all of medical school and all of graduate school, I never heard the word genomics? Uh, and it is a very young discipline. So I actually did a little bit of digging to figure out when was the first usage, at least in the scientific literature, of the word genomics, and how come I had never heard about it in graduate school or medical school? And a little bit of digging revealed that the origin of the word genomics truly was 1987, the year I actually graduated. In fact, what I could find was the first use of it was with the creation of this new journal called Genomics, which I'm very familiar with. And this was the opening editorial for that journal, uh, which among other things, they talked about the name, and they said, for this newly developing discipline of genome mapping sequencing, including the analysis of the information, we have adopted the term genomics. The new discipline is born from a marriage of molecular and cell biology with classical genetics and is fostered by computational science. Very similar to what we're going to exactly cover um, in this series of lectures as part of this course. This was, as far as I know, the first usage in the scientific literature of the word genomics. And I dug a little deeper to find out, well, somebody still must have come up with a name to create the journal. And it turned out that, as is often the case, Bethesda and NIH played a major role in this. And a little bit of digging revealed a historical piece written in the Journal of the National Cancer Institute much later, but was looking back, and basically talked about a workshop that was held, uh, sponsored by NIH here in Bethesda. And a guy named Thomas Roderick at the Jackson Labs was a participant in the workshop. And over beer in the evening that night after the workshop and sort of all the participants went out and had dinner and beer and so forth, uh, they sort of, he was attributed to coming up with this name. We need a name for this new emerging area of comprehensively studying the DNA of organisms and the word genomics was born. So interesting enough, I think it does go back to about 1987-ish when genomics first came to pass. And the reason it was important to come up with a name for this, of course, was that the late 1980s were a time when scientific leaders were strategizing about the notion of comprehensively analyzing, mapping, and then sequencing the human genome. And of course, that led rise to this monumental project called the Human Genome Project, which was formulated in the late 1980s, about the time genomics as a word was uh, coined, and then launched in October of 1990. Um, I actually was fortunate enough to be a participant in the project from day one as a frontline participant, as a postdoctoral fellow, and will tell you that when the project started, uh, we had no idea how we were going to do this. Uh, we really, there was an amazing amount of things that had to be figured out on how to map DNA efficiently, 
and eventually had a sequence DNA to scale that would support the sequencing of something as large as the human genome. But it was a remarkable international endeavor that galvanized interest of thousands of scientists around the world, and uh, the rest is history. Remarkably hard work, dedicated efforts, remarkable creativity, leading to the completion of the project about 13 years later in April of 2003 which now is about 11 years ago, and in fact, last year, uh, we celebrated in various ways, including in this amphitheater, in a number of ways, the 10-year anniversary of completing the Human Genome Project quite successfully. Well, there's been incredible growth uh, since the end of the Human Genome Project in the field of genomics. There's just been so many applications of genomics, many of which I know you're familiar with or hear about or read about, and many of them aren't even directly in our main area of biomedical research. In fact, the areas shown here have all been greatly advanced uh, by the tools and technologies and information associated with genomics. And some of these disciplines, genomics is having a very major impact. This is not what I'm going to talk about. It's not sort of the mainstream of, of the human genomics landscape that I wish to paint. What I'm going to paint, not surprisingly, being at the National Institutes of Health, is the application of genomics to health, disease, and medicine. And needless to say, this isn't entirely surprising because as soon as the Human Genome Project ended, there was significant interest in now using this foundational information about the human genome to start to think about how to improve the practice of medicine using genomic information. And whether you saw in the popular press, such as the New York Times, or the scientific press, such as Science Magazine, terms like genomic medicine started to come to the fore. There were entire series of major journals that were uh, dedicated to articles in genomic medicine, entire journals established, such as genome medicine, and then major textbooks were created that either said genomic medicine or personalized medicine or one of these other words that's largely synonymous with genomic medicine. This quickly became a vibrant and important area to think about in terms of applications uh, to clinical medicine. So like a drumbeat of interest, one might imagine there was significant interest in the field of using genomics in ways to improve human health. The term I tend to use, I think that NHGRI tends to use, is the term genomic medicine. Again, largely synonymous with individualized medicine, precision medicine, uh, personalized medicine, so forth. And we take a very um, narrow definition of this, and this is what's shown here. We regard genomic medicine as an emerging medical discipline that involves using genomic information about an individual as part of their clinical care, for example, for diagnostic or therapeutic decision making, and other implications of that clinical use. And this, very, this definition and it very much is, is a key focus of what is going on now in human genomics research, both here at NIH and really in many ways around the world. The way I like to think of this, um, and I do think about this a lot, is that we have a long journey ahead of us. Um, and that journey really began with the end of the Human Genome Project. That, in many ways, was the starting line for this very long journey. And uh, I think one day we truly will realize genomic medicine. And we need to define and then traverse that path. And the various steps along the way, some are known and some are straightforward. Some are known and they're really hard. And some we simply don't even know yet. We go into a journey like this, optimistic, because we were wildly successful at the Genome Project. We've got to believe we're going to be successful at realizing genomic medicine, and when we are successful, I think we'll have fulfilled the promise of why we said we should do the Human Genome Project in the first place. So how do we pursue such a journey? How do we define that path? How do we make those steps successful ones? Well, I'll tell you that the field of genomics is very much driven by very thoughtful and strategic planning. Um, it goes back to what I said earlier about the Human Genome Project. When the Genome Project began, we had a goal. We had no idea how we really were going to attain that goal. And what we did was go through a series of strategic planning processes almost every two to three years to define how to accomplish the goals of the Human Genome Project. And that very much has become sort of part of our culture, that when we sort of see what needs to be done, we have strategic planning process and then have in a very transparent way of, way of articulating that vision. And so thinking about this journey from the base pairs of the Genome Project to the bedside of patients, or if you prefer the metaphor from helix to health, Literally, the day the Genome Project ended, NHGRI published a strategic vision on behalf of the whole field of genomics that articulated sort of the next phase for genomics research, having in hand a sequence of the human genome. And it was a very good plan that served, uh, I think, the field and the institute and NIH well. Um, but because of accomplishments, it turned out um, it wasn't going to even last a decade. 
And so by 2011, we underwent another major strategic planning process, again, engaging the field uh, very broadly, including international scientists and hundreds of scientists, actually, in total, and then articulated um, a strategic vision now several years ago um, that really now described the next phase for human genomics research. In particular, you could note that it has a major emphasis on actually now applying genomics to clinical medicine and even uses the phrase genomic medicine in the title. If you've not seen this strategic plan, which I'm going to describe to you in a little bit of detail now, I would urge you to jump to this URL and freely download it, or certainly you can get to it by going to Nature, but a convenient URL um, is right there for you to find that strategic plan. Interestingly, what we heard in 2010, leading up to the strategic plan in 2011, which was very different than what we heard in 2002, leading to the 2003 strategic plan, the difference was that now, for this plan, it was time to be more specific and more sophisticated in describing how it was that you were going to actually apply this to clinical medicine. And at the end of the day, we found it very useful to describe a research agenda for the field that really had all the programs and projects, or most of them, falling into five major domains of research activities. Let me introduce you to those five domains because they really become a framework by which lots of nearly everything we're doing um, falls within. The, the first domain was very familiar to us, doing genomics research to understand the structure of genomes, how genomes are put together. That's really what our origins were in the Genome Project, so that's a very comfortable, familiar domain to us. Of course, the next domain uses the knowledge of structure to understand function, using genomic research to understand the biology of genomes, how they work. With knowledge of how genomes work, you can start to understand how differences in genomes might play a role in disease. So the middle domain is using genomics to understand the biology of disease, insights about genomic variation as it pertains to disease. And with that knowledge, one could imagine then using genomics to advance medical science. And so that domain is all about advancing the discipline of medicine. Of course, we were told don't stop there, that there's also a responsibility to make sure that you can actually change healthcare for people. And delivery of healthcare is a pretty complicated thing, so it was also important to do research to demonstrate that you can actually improve the effectiveness of healthcare uh, using genomic approaches. So these five domains really represent, a, notice, a progression from more basic science-oriented research to more clinical research, but also a logical progression of how to go from basic knowledge of the genome to actually changing the practice of medicine. So let me tell you now a series of steps that have been um, pursued, and in many cases uh, quite uh, successfully, in, in, in going across these five domains that have happened uh, since the end of the Human Genome Project in particular. And the first step really speaks is, is really to the first couple of domains, which is really understanding the function of the human genome sequence, going from structure to fundamental functional knowledge about the genome. Now, you may say, wait a second, why did you need to do that? Isn't that what the Human Genome Project did? Well, let me just remind you that the Human Genome Project really was about first mapping the human genome, getting organized, and then sequencing, reading out the three billion letters of the human genome sequence. It was not about interpreting the human genome sequence. We always knew that that was going to be something that would have to happen after the Human Genome Project and something that was likely going to be incredibly difficult, and indeed it is incredibly difficult. So really, the Genome Project, you know, simply produced this, although this is only 0.0001 percent of what the Genome Project produced. It produced an ordering of the G's, A's, T's, and C's. We needed to go in then and spend probably what will be decades interpreting what those letters actually mean. When the Human Genome Project ended, we have to be candid here. Our tools for actually understanding the meaning of this sequence was actually quite uh, nascent, shall we say. Um, there were some things we understood well, and there were many things we didn't understand well and we still don't understand well. What do we understand well? Well, one of the things we understood well is we, we understood genes. Because at that point when the Genome Project ended, we knew about introns and exons, and we even knew about alternate splicing, and we knew how things got shuffled around those exons that produced different kinds of transcripts, and, and importantly, we also knew the genetic code. So looking at DNA sequence, especially computationally, and trying to figure out where are the genes, um, while it wasn't simple, it was at least uh, approachable. And so that was the first thing we were able to do quite effectively was to start to develop catalogs of all the genes, albeit with lots of complexities of alternate transcripts and, and so on and so forth. But fundamentally, this is where we could get the biggest head start on. 
And so off we went, and many investigators worked very hard to develop gene catalogs and highlighting those parts of the human genome that directly coded for proteins, protein coding genes. Now, of course, there's a lot more complexity associated with what is now known to be a catalog of about 20,000 genes, and a lot of that complexity has to do with gene expression and all the regulation that goes on in figuring out where, when, and how much those 20,000 genes are turned on. And we're going to bring you an expert in Paul Meltzer, who in May will come here and talk about gene expression in particular and methods associated and strategies associated for studying gene expression. But of course, we need to move beyond, we needed to move beyond genes. And we had a suspicion there was a lot of complexity associated with other parts of the genome that didn't directly code for protein. But we really didn't have tools for understanding how to get at those. We didn't have a genetic code. We looked at our, our, our wonderful iconic figures and see all the things they had taught us and realized that, wow, we even needed a different consultant to help us on the non-coding parts of the genome and how they function. And ironically, the best consultant available to us at the end of the Genome Project was someone that predated all these individuals. Because the best lessons of what we needed to do to study the genome were provided to us by this individual, Charles Darwin. Because, in, in fact, the next major phase of interpreting the human genome sequence really required a fundamental understanding of the properties of evolution that Darwin had taught us. And among the many things that was attributed to Darwin, he taught, pointed out how it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent that survives, it's the one most adaptable to change. And fundamentally, over the course of millions of years of evolutionary time, uh, genomes have been tinkered with through evolutionary forces. And some things, when they get tinkered with, work and some don't, but some things just don't change at all. And if they don't change at all, it's probably because they confer important biological properties that cannot be messed with, and in doing so, those might give us clues by studying uh, other genomes about what, and what can and cannot be tolerated to be changed. It is the reason why a very prominent genome researcher, Eric Lander, made the comment a number of years ago that for the past, past three and a half billion years, evolution has been taking notes. And in fact, all those notes were scripted in the genome sequences of other species. And so the idea came to the fore of, well, we could understand the human genome sequence better if we could simply compare it to other genomes and figure out what has and has not changed. Read those notebooks of evolution, which have, will be able to teach us key lessons. And of course, humans are just a small little twig on this very complicated phylogenetic tree of vertebrates. And it became very obvious we could sequence and we could actually sequence better than we could readily understand the non-coding parts of the human genome. And so that is the reason why even before the Genome Project ended, we were off sequencing the mouse genome and the rat genome because they were laboratory models, but also companion animals like dog and our closest relative, the chimpanzee. But we also knew, almost from some of the lessons Darwin had taught us, that we needed to reach wider across the phylogenetic tree. And so many more species got added after the Human Genome Project ended. And in total, there were about 30 really good quality um, uh, genomes, at least a draft form, that were generated enough to do the kinds of analyses that were required. And the idea was feed, and, and by the way, take critters off of representative branches of the phylogenetic tree to get as much statistical power that you're surveying widely across all vertebrates, all mammals in particular. And feed all that data into a computer and simply start looking and ask the question, when you line up all those sequences, what parts are the most conserved relative to the human genome, because that's almost for certain going to be the parts of the human genome that are functionally important. And that has given us tremendous insights and in taking a very large body of work, let me just summarize it in a few slides, just by the numbers. We now know that about 5 percent or so of the human genome sequence is constrained basically across all mammals, and they're sort of for, if it's that heavily conserved or constrained, it's almost for certain going to serve some functional role. So about 5 or so percent. Now, that's about 5 percent of 3 billion letters. About 150 million bases are found in the same, in the same position of virtually all mammals. It's probably a lower bound for the amount that's actually functional. In fact, we know it's a lower bound, but it certainly is the most important initial 5 percent to characterize and understand. But only a small fraction, only about a third of that actually directly encodes for proteins, for protein coding genes. Of that 5 percent, only a third or so directly codes for proteins. Now, this corresponds, I told you, to about 20,000 genes. And of course, lots of things happen with our genes. It gets much more complicated, alternate transcripts, post-translational modifications, so forth. Clearly, we make, as a, as a species, many, many more than that many uh, proteins, more than 22,000 proteins. Our complexity comes in beyond our gene number. 
but that's only about a third of that most conserved 5%. What's the other 3.5% of our genome that is conserved to the same degree as genes? What's it doing? And of course, it's functioning in biological ways other than directly coding for protein. Now, we have some insights what, we, what this likely is, it looks like. We just don't have complete insights yet. Among the non-coding functional sequences, there's clearly a lot that is dedicated to gene regulation and all the complexities of, of enhancers and insulators and silencers and, and promoters and so on and so forth. Those are all highly, con or many are highly conserved, and these are all functioning in ways other than directly coding for proteins. But we also know there's sequences involved in packaging up our DNA and chromosomes and, and sequences involved in making sure that chromosomes segregate properly and sequences that play a vital role in accurately replicating our chromosomes. Oh, and by the way, then there's that whole world of non-coding RNAs that is just exploding in biological complexity. And of course, those don't directly code for proteins. They're within that 3.5% that represents non-coding functional sequences. And finally, we should acknowledge there's stuff we just don't know. It's functioning in ways that we haven't even figured out yet, certainly is not described in textbooks yet. We need to find those sequences, characterize them, and eventually catalog them comprehensively. So there is this additional 3.5% of the most highly conserved, almost certainly functional sequences that don't directly code for protein. And as I alluded to, they're regulating genes, they're helping chromosomes function, and then there are some undiscovered functional elements as well. So that's one challenge, understanding the functional elements, coding and non-coding within the genome. But that's not the only story, of course, because our genome is even more complicated than that. There's a whole other language out there that's not the order of the Gs, As, Ts, and Cs, but rather it's the way DNA gets decorated by methyl groups and gets associated with histone proteins and this whole other code of epigenomics, which increasingly we are learning, plays a major role in genome function. Um, when Laura Elnitsky comes here in March, she's going to talk about each of these last two topics, epigenomics and epigenetics, but also all these complexities of gene regulation, all very relevant in terms of the non-coding functional sequences in the genome. And the reason why epigenomics has become extremely hot lately is because we now have methods to read out that code, that these new methods, which I'll get to a, a, a shortly, about sequencing DNA can be used to read out marks on our DNA and epigenomic uh, um, uh, modifications of our DNA. And that technological advance has greatly accelerated the pace of our understanding that epigenomic land, um, um, catalog as well. We recognize that in order to get a comprehensive view of all of these coding regions and non-coding regions that are functionally important, it was important to have very large effort dedicated to cataloging those elements. And through a series of projects uh, in code, it for, stands for Encyclopedia of DNA Elements, which is focused on human genome and mouse genome, and also MOD ENCODE for model organism ENCODE, concentrating um, on Drosophila and nematode. Uh, large consortiums have been working on those. Um, in particular, the ENCODE consortium continues to work quite um, aggressively at understanding the human genome sequence and developing rich encyclopedia-type information about all of the functional elements and all the epigenomic modifications associated with genome function. And increasingly, and of course, all this data is made publicly available, and I hope all of you take advantage of this. You can go to appropriate browsers, and you'll learn about some of these and bring up remarkably rich amounts of data, such as shown here for two regions of the human genome, almost overwhelming amounts of data, computational data, um, experimental data, that tells you all sorts of things about, compare, about conserved sequences, expressed air, regions of the genome, regions that are bound by transcription factors or other proteins, regions that have open chromatin, um, gene models, so on and so forth. I like to think of this almost like a GPS, if you will, in your car, that we have the sort of the fundamental sequence as the roads, but then the GPS annotates that with other information, like where's the closest gas station and where's the closest place to eat. These kind of views tell you where is the closest gene, where is the closest transcription factor binding region, so on and so forth. And increasingly, we're trying to develop tools to allow you to navigate this massive amount of data to come up with the clearest interpretation of what are the important functional regions in a segment of the genome that you happen to be studying. But like anything else, we recognize that it gets more complicated than that because it's not just DNA as a linear molecule and it's G's, A's, T's, and C's and it's various epigenomic marks that is conferring function, but that there is a three-dimensional life to DNA in chromosomes in the nucleus of, of cells and is now being recognized increasingly 
that the genome has three-dimensional properties that confer function, and different regions of the genome on different chromosomes actually get together sometime and transmit information in ways that we need to understand, and better and better methods are coming now available to, under, to be able to detect and eventually understand what those interjections are. So the bottom line is this is a whole new frontier of genome function that we need to understand and we're trying to study. So to summarize this first step of understanding all of the functional parts of the human genome, um, I sometimes joke, especially with the younger generation who loves spark notes, apparently, that this is sort of where we are right now. We sort of have a spark notes view of the human genome. You know, maybe it gets you ready for the test tomorrow, but it's not going to get you ready for the future of biomedical research. We will be interpreting and cataloging and hammering away on the human genome sequence for decades to come. It's a lot of complexity in those three billion letters. That said, in the past 11 years, we've made remarkable progress in getting sort of the first generation catalogs up to speed and uh, the kinds that are actually can be quite helpful. Before I move on to the sort of the next phase of research accomplishments in route to genomic medicine, just as an aside, the other thing that comparative genomics, as I've described to, has allowed us to do in addition to understanding the function of the human genome sequence, this is also teaching us a tremendous amount about human evolution, um, both with respect to our closest primate relatives, but also with respect to our now no longer here, the closest relatives such as Neanderthal. And that's a whole topic in and of itself that is way cool, especially those of you interested in evolution. I'll put in a quick plug because it'll be very special to have a real world expert here on this campus um, um, as part of a lecture series that we're putting on associated with something else. Um, Svante Pabo, who is a world leader in understanding um, and sequencing things like Neanderthal genomes and so on and so forth, um, will be here in March. You can see a little advertisement there over at a different auditorium here in Building 10. And I strongly urge you to try to get to this talk if you're interested in uh, what he is learning by doing some very fancy sequencing of, of specimens of Neanderthal and other early human ancestors. So that's an aside. Let's get back to the topic. We want to get you closer to genomic medicine. Well, the first step of understanding how the human genome sequence works teaches us something about how a generic human genome might operate. But of course, what we really want to understand is how each of our genomes work. In particular, we want to understand eventually how our patients' genomes operate. And to understand that, we need to understand how they're different. So the second major area of accomplishment since the end of the Human Genome Project has been in understanding human genomic variation. Uh, this is, again, mostly research in these first two domains among this five-domain progression. Now, what is known? Well, what is known at a very basic level and was even before the Genome Project ended is that each of us has a difference in our sequence about one out of a thousand bases. Uh, compared to the person sitting next to you, for example. So these variants, which I show sprinkled across a given stretch of DNA, are fairly frequent, about one in a thousand. And, but it turns out that the great, great, great majority of those variants really are inconsequential uh, in terms of any sort of phenotypic effect. But a subset are consequential. Some of them are not good variants. They may confer a risk for getting a disease or may overtly cause a disease. And others might be beneficial. They may make you resistant or, or, or less vulnerable to getting a disease, or maybe they would make you a good candidate for getting, using a particular type of medication. But of course, we want to understand which is which, which ones we can forget about, which ones are, are not so good, which ones are good, and so forth. And we'd like to have a catalog, and you know us genomicists, when, when we want a catalog, we put together big science efforts and off we go. And indeed, it was recognized that it would be incredibly valuable to have catalogs of at least the most common variants that exist in the human population. Turns out that it's not that all your variants are private. In fact, most of the variants you have are shared with lots of other people. Wouldn't it be nice to have that information, have scientists be able to analyze those, figure out which ones are medically relevant? So off we went. The first thing off the gates was a consortium called the SNP Consortium, Single Nucleotide Polymorphism Consortium, to start cataloging some of the more common single nucleotide polymorphisms. That led to a new international effort consortium called the International HapMap Project, which aims to not only develop information about the most common variants, but also to start to develop information about what's known as the haplotype structure of the human genome, because it turns out that our variants don't just sort of go from one generation to the next at random, but rather there's neighborhood blocks on each of our chromosomes that each contain a number of variants, and those blocks tend to be inherited 
um, as one entire block from generation to generation. And that had some really important implications that future speakers will be, will be talking about. And this was a very successful consortium and put out several major publications in nature. Uh, but then, um, when new technologies became available, it was very clear we needed to even be more aggressive about cataloging the most common genomic variants across human populations. And that gave rise to the latest project called the Thousand Genomes Project, another international effort, which um, drew on a collection of DNA samples from now not just 1,000 people. We were overachievers. We said it was 1,000 genomes, but now it's over 2,500 genomes. And they were collected from 26 populations to collect geographic diversity across the world and make those DNA samples widely available and making all the information about these variants also widely available on the Internet. And uh, Thousand Genomes Project came out with its pilot effort publication in 2010 and uh, a couple years ago now uh, reported on the first thousand and later this year we'll be publishing a major paper reporting on the full 2,500 um, samples. And what do we have? Well, we now have data for over 90 million genomic variants that we know exist and lots of information about what populations they exist in and at what frequencies and so forth. Um, when Lynn Jordy is here in April, he'll be talking about lots of things. I'm sure he'll talk about data from 1,000 genomes. He'll be talking about population genomics because population genomics has been greatly advanced through efforts like the SNP consortium, the HapMap project, and 1,000 genomes. So you'll hear lots about genomic variation. Uh, when Lynn Jordy gives his presentation. The other thing a thousand genomes project has done, having sequenced now thousands of genomes, is it starts to give us insights about what does a typical person's genome look like, not some hypothetical reference genome sequence. What does a person's genome look like? So just for fun, I'll just show you what some of these numbers are starting to look like. Um, what does your genome look like? What does your patient's genome look like? And just in terms of differences. So, each of our genomes is about 6 billion nucleotides, right? You got 3 billion from mom, you got 3 billion from dad, about 6 billion in total. And it turns out, and if you did the arithmetic, that's what you come out with, that most people have about 3 to 5 million single nucleotide variants, where a base at a given position is different compared to, let's say, the person sitting next to you. Now, as I alluded to, the great, 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 great majority of those variants, if I would sequence any one of your genomes, the great majority, we've already seen. They're in the database, yep, known by one of these big cataloging projects. But a small subset, about 150,000 on average, are not in databases. So every new human genome that we sequence, we learn about 150,000 new variants that hadn't been seen before. Probably because they're relatively rare, maybe just in your family or just maybe in your little extended family, but fundamentally it's sufficiently low, we haven't seen it yet. And it actually turns out that out of your 150,000 variants, that are unique, or have we never seen before, uh, 60 of them are truly unique to you, are not in either parent. So in the process of creating you and replicating the DNA of each parent, there were 60 oopses. There were replication errors that got introduced, and those are new. And some of those, um, probably the great majority of them have no phenotypic consequence, but some of them, small subset, probably do. Now, what is the consequence of these variants on average for a given person? Well, as you might imagine, knowing if a variant is relevant, you have to have some knowledge about the sequence and what the functional elements are around that sequence and so forth. And that's really hard for non-coding DNA, but at least for coding DNA, uh, we know the rules because Marshall Nuremberg helped teach them to us. And so as a result, we can at least say on average how many times when you have all these variants, you have broken genes that would seem to be deleterious. And the answer is that each of us harbors about 100 variants that disrupt break a gene by some criteria. We have about 100 broken genes. Now, the great majority of those genes we have two copies of, so we have one broken one and one, one fine one. But it does turn out that each of us carries about 20 genes where both copies are broken. So one way to think about it is out of your 20,000 genes, about 20 of them are broken, both copies that you have. And some of that might have biological consequences and explain some of the differences among us, and some of them might be inconsequential because of the redundancy that exists in, in some gene families in particular. So that's what we now know, at least as of today, in terms of human genomic variation. And of course, that nicely sets up the third domain that I introduced you to, using that knowledge about human genomic variation to begin to study um, the basis for human disease. And of course, that is square center of the, in this, within this five domain progression. Now, to understand and appreciate the, what's happened over the last 10 and 11 years, it's important to recognize some fundamentals 
about, about genetic disease and the underlying genomic architecture. Keep in mind that every disease has a genomic influence, if not an overt genomic cause. There's practically not a disease you can name that I couldn't call with some evidence of having a genetic or genomic influence. But diseases are very different depending upon whether they are rare or common, and that's the dichotomy. So on the one hand, you have rare diseases, diseases like sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, and Huntington's disease that are rare in the population but turn out to be genetically simple and genomically simple because it's really it's a single gene that is broken that is the dominant risk for getting the disease. Uh, yes, there might be other variants in the genome that might influence the severity of disease, um, but, but fundamentally, and there might even be some environmental contribution, but really you're looking for one broken gene as the cause of the disease. That's why they're called monogenic disorders or Mendelian disorders, named after the famous geneticist Gregory Mendel that I introduced you to earlier. Now, these are devastating disorders, and they certainly affect uh, patients and families in very uh, adverse ways, but they don't represent the bulk of healthcare burden worldwide. The bulk of healthcare burden worldwide are common diseases, because these are diseases that fill hospitals and clinics. These are diseases like hypertension and diabetes and cardiovascular disease and many forms of mental illness and so on and so forth. And they're very common in the population, but unfortunately, they're incredibly complicated because it's not a single gene or a single variant, but rather it is a series of variants that in aggregate confer risk for the disease with what is often a greater contribution of the environment. That's why they're known as genetically complex or multigenic or non-Mendelian disorders. Now, let me emphasize what I'm going to talk about, because it's what I do, is I'm going to talk about the genetic and genomic contributions of disease. But do keep in mind that for especially complex diseases, environment plays a very important role here. But there's a, one of the, a couple of reasons why I'm not going to talk about environment side of this equation, one of which is not what I do, but the other part of it is keep in mind how the technological advances that have happened in the last 11 years around studying genomic variation have been remarkable, and I think environmental monitoring technologies, really getting ability to monitor our environment, uh, they'll come, but, but the technologies just aren't nearly as powerful yet. And as a result, the reason you hear, sometimes when we talk about this, people think, oh, you think genetics is everything, and genomics, it's, it's not, it's just that it's what we're able to learn. In the last 10 years, our technologies have given us powerful new insights about this side of the pie chart, but when we get better technologies for environmental monitoring, we'll have to fill in our knowledge on this other part of the pie chart. But well, what's happened in rare diseases and common diseases since the end of the Genome Project? Let's start with rare diseases, and it's been pretty impressive. Shown here is a cumulative graph for disorders for which we figured out the genomic basis. We found the defective gene. And let me put it in context. The day the Genome Project ended, there were 61 disorders for which we knew the broken gene. 61. And now you could hardly argue with the fact that as soon as some of the earliest mapping and sequencing data came out from the Genome Project and beyond, the pace of our knowledge about the genomic basis of rare diseases grew steadily and continues to grow to the present time. To give you another perspective, we now know the genomic basis for about 5,100 disorders. When there was just 61 we knew when the Genome Project began, to now it's 5,100. That number grows every week. But that is the glass half full. There is a glass half empty side of it because there's another 2,000, 1,600 or so disorders that we know is, or almost for certain believe a single gene's involved and don't yet know the genomic basis. And another 2,000 on top of that, or 1,700, that we think a single gene's involved and we haven't figured it out. So this is a big challenge, is to fill in this pie chart. And uh, I will tell you that when Dave Valley is here, a world expert on rare diseases, he will be giving a lecture about this, and I am sure he will talk about these numbers and what is being done to fill in this pie chart. And we'll come back to this pie chart later in my talk briefly when I take you into the future. So that's pretty impressive, though, rare diseases. What about common diseases? Those are complicated. Would we ever be able to get enough statistical power to tease out the different variants that work together to confer risk for some of these very vaccine disorders like hypertension and diabetes and, and asthma and so forth and Alzheimer's disease. And it really wasn't known, and in some ways we still don't know how far we'll be able to go with this. But a strategy emerged as we got better and better catalogs of the more common variants that exist in the human population to start to, on a very large scale, take collections of individuals with and without a disease and study which of these known variants they happen to have, those with the disease, those without the disease, and start to scan across the genome in a genome-wide way 
and look for statistical associations with having a variant of a particular flavor and getting the disease. And this resulted in this idea of a genome-wide association study. And genome-wide association studies were argued about whether they would work or not, um, and would you be able to detect specific regions of the genome harboring variants that confer risk for a disease? And there was, there was optimism, uh, and by the way, Karen Mulkey, when she is here, will describe this in much more sophisticated detail than I've just done now, because of course this is a, this is a lecture in and of itself and a, a rapidly emerging area that it actually gets pretty complicated, but I know Karen will be able to talk you through this because uh, of the kinds of knowledge that she has and familiarity of a dedicating a career to untangling this. There was some optimism that came um, when the first publication of a successful genome-wide association study using some of the earliest HapMap data was published, involved some NIH researchers, in fact, uh, here in 2005, and that was the first paper. And as Karen will tell you, fast forward to the present time, and if you simply put a little circle or a little lollipop around every single region of the human genome that has been found by a genome-wide association study to be statistically associated with getting a disease, a complex disease, this is the latest graphic, which you can just see is just littered with these little lollipops on each of the human chromosomes. And we're in 2005 was the first paper describing this. Today, over 1,800 publications have reported successful genome-wide association studies. In aggregate, about 3,900 associations for different regions of the genome for about 400 different diseases and traits. Now, that doesn't tell us the cause of the disease. It doesn't even always tell you which variant is the one that's implicated in, 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 in that association or the actual causal variant, but it gives us lots of regions of the human genome to now interrogate in greater detail. So those are the studies that will go on, and Karen will tell you more about it. That's the glass half full on genome-wide association studies. There is a glass half-empty part that is sobering but important to recognize and maybe motivating to some of you. Is the other thing we've learned as we've dug deeper in, in the last 11 years and made advances in rare diseases and then common diseases is we've now learned that in, it's seemingly for rare diseases, the great, great, great majority of the variants, the mutations that cause rare diseases basically break genes. They, they're, they're mutations in coding regions. And that's in strict contrast to the genome-wide association studies, with more, which more times than not point to non-coding portions of the genome as the areas that have variants conferring risk for complex diseases. What does that mean? That means for the diseases that fill hospitals and clinics and have the greatest healthcare burden worldwide, they are being caused by variants that fall in the regions of the genome that we don't yet understand well enough. So if there's ever a motivating reason to better understand the non-coding parts of the human genome, it's because they harbor variants that are going to turn out to be incredibly important for the most common diseases afflicting humankind. And so that is a greatly motivating feature of studying the human genome and how it works and also following up these very complicated studies that are going to really still require a lot of hard work to tease out which of the variants actually conferring the risk for these common diseases. One of the things that's clearly going to be required to truly tease out common disease architecture with respect to variants are very large studies that involve sequencing the genomes of not just hundreds or even thousands of individuals with or without disease, but almost certainly tens of thousands of individuals with or without a given disease of interest. And that is why it is so important that the next step is successful, and that is to be able to routinely sequence whole genomes. Routine whole genome sequencing then becomes extremely important initially for these first three regions, but as you'll see, it's also going to be similarly important for the more distal clinically oriented uh, domains as well. Well, I want to take you back to 2003 with this strategic plan I introduced you to, because the day the Human Genome Project ended and we published the strategic plan, one of the things we called for, and we knew it back then, was that we needed technological leaps almost as soon as possible that would seem so far off at the time as to be almost fictional but which, if they could be achieved, would revolutionize biomedical research and clinical practice. And what we said in the strategic plan as an example was the ability to sequence DNA at costs that are lower by four to five orders of magnitude than the current cost, allowing the human genome to be sequenced for $1,000 or less. So this was put into print the day the genome project ended, the day we had just finished sequencing the first human genome, at a time when we had basically sequenced that genome at a cost of about a billion dollars. And we were calling for new technologies that would lop six zeros off of that figure and deliver a genome sequence of humans for $1,000. Pretty audacious 
to say, but nonetheless, it became a battle cry for the community. The $1,000 genome became the slogan, and the idea was, can we accelerate the pace of technological innovation in DNA sequencing that would allow us to retire the factories that were used for sequencing the human genome, here's one of those factories, and eventually produce something, a micro or a nano or whatever, something incredibly inexpensive that would allow us to basically get a million-fold reduction in the cost of sequencing uh, DNA or more. And in fact, the rest is history, and uh, there's just been remarkable technological innovation shown here, are, are not even all, some of the platforms that have come um, to pass since then. And I'm not going to spend much time talking about these next generation sequencing platforms uh, because we have a world leader in this, Elaine Martis, coming in May to describe this in much greater detail. Uh, but needless to say, uh, these technologies, one of these machines can now do in a day or two what uh, thousands of researchers and hundreds of machines uh, took about six or seven years to do during the Human Genome Project. And the impact has been seen. Um, in terms of the cost reductions with respect to sequencing the human genome. Shown here is sort of an iconic graph that our institute puts out because we have a lot of data, because we monitor the cost of sequencing from our funded sequencing centers. And just to sort of walk you through it, um, this is the cost for sequencing the human genome, with the y-axis being logarithmic, and shown in a white line is Moore's Law. Moore's Law is the law of the compute industry that says compute power doubles every 24 months or so, with the claims that nobody keeps up with Moore's Law except for the computer industry, except for genomics. We now do better than Moore's Law. Shown in green is the cost for sequencing the human genome going back to the early 2000s. And right here, our sequencing centers switched over to next generation platforms on the previous slide. And you can see they have blown Moore's Law out of the water ever since. And it's been really remarkable with respect to those cost reductions. But also keep in mind that it also affects the speed at which you can sequence a genome. So when we sequenced that first human genome as part of the Human Genome Project, we were actively sequencing human DNA across the whole world for about six to eight years, and it cost about a billion dollars at the end of the day. The day the Genome Project ended, it was estimated, just back of the envelope, that if we went to sequence the second human genome, it would still take about three to four months to pull it off, and it would still cost about 10 to 50 million dollars. Today, not today, it's a whole different world. Using these fancy new technologies, it takes anywhere from one to three days. Actually, it really does look like it's going to be down to a day or so with some of the platforms that were just released and are coming out and going to be used over the next few months. And the cost, not quite $1,000. The first claim of instruments that are going to be available later this year, maybe getting it down to $1,000. We'll see. But the fact is, it's well below $10,000. We've seen that million-fold improvement already, and we're getting it down to the cost of, uh, that is certainly approaching $1,000. And I don't worry about this stuff anymore. I, I feel so confident that we'll get down to $1,000. It very much is like sitting at the airport, just sort of watching planes coming in for a landing. I know of new technologies that are coming on board next year, the year after, maybe a few years after that. The current suite of platforms we'll throw away in about two or three years, probably, because there'll be new ones that supplant those. Um, amongst exciting new technologies, you'll hear more and more about in 2014, because the first such instruments are hitting sequencing groups, include the nanopore. Uh, they talk about these fancy devices that allow you to take DNA and read it through these nanopores. And one of the instruments, which is really hitting laboratories, I think this month, is an, a small mini device that's shown here that plugs into the USB port of your laptop and will read out, allegedly, a human genome sequence in something like a day. So they claim, I'm not endorsing this instrument. I just think it's way cool that it goes in a USB device of a laptop. I also think it's way cool that the company promises it works equally well in a PC or a Macintosh laptop. <laughs> so I'm excited to see. And these devices are just starting to hit some of the groups uh, in really this month or next. Remarkable advances, and I could promise you, ones you don't even know about are coming that are going to continue to reduce the cost, increase the speed of sequencing human genomes. It is a situation that I almost really now refer to genome sequencing, the sequencing part of it, as a commodity. I am not sure NIH laboratories are going to be sequencing human genomes in the laboratory, whether that's just going to sort of be a send out as a commodity. Maybe companies will be better doing this. Maybe it'll be totally outsourced. I don't know. This is not what's rate limited anymore. We can generate the data incredibly inexpensively, and it's going to even get cheaper yet. The, the real bottleneck is no longer in producing human genome sequence or DNA sequence of any kind, it is becoming a commodity. But, but that's not to say there's not a bottleneck. And the bottleneck 
is the next step, which is to be able to actually analyze that sequence. This is the biggest bottleneck now in genomics, and you'll hear about this from other speakers as well. It's a pervasive problem across all of these domains, and it's all our fault. We created this. We're the ones that say develop new technologies, and when you develop these fancy new technology, they will spew out lots of data. The problem is, is when they're so effectively spewing out data, they overwhelm us. And the truth of the matter is, this is the reality we live in now. We live in now where data generation is not the bottleneck. It used to be. Now it's data analysis that's the bottleneck. And that bottleneck has a lot of components. I mean, the truth is, these fancy methods for sequencing DNA will produce a human genome sequence in a day or two or three. And we could slog through that data, and it's even cumbersome, but we can slog through it, and we can even come up with that list of three to five million variants in any given person. But then all of a sudden, just, you, know, you, you face a lot of, of hardship on doing this on a large scale. Really industrializes the kind of scale that's needed for the studies that need to be done now, have bottlenecks in terms of just hardware and just dealing with all the amount of data and, and pushing the data from site to site. And, um, and, and, and enough processors to analyze the kind of amounts of data we're dealing with. There's all sorts of issues around software tools, because while every one of these platforms is way cool, every one of the platforms needs specialized software to deal with its idiosyncrasies of the data that's produced. There's trainees, listen here. There's huge issues around workforce, especially the next generation workforce. Thinking about what is the next generation of, of biomedical researcher, let alone a genome scientist, what do they look like? And how are we going to get them adequately trained to deal with what is going to be basically heavy lifting of large data sets? Oh, and even when we get to the point of having that list of those three to five million variants, trust me, we ponder and ponder and ponder for most of those variants. We don't know automatically whether a variant is biologically relevant or not. Every one of these steps represents a bottleneck, and, um, and, and it, it's, it's really has multiple aspects to it. It's also not unique to genomics. There's other areas of biomedical research that, that have similar bottlenecks. It is the reason why, as Andy alluded to, a major emphasis of this series of lectures is to sort of work through the bioinformatics, computational biology, data science side of genomics. And that is why you can see that Andy and Tira, just among themselves, have three lectures to walk you through this because it's such a vital and integral part of what's going on in genomics now. So those are the steps I really wanted to highlight as being the accomplishments since the end of the Genome Project. But what about these more clinically oriented areas? Because I've led you almost to genomic medicine, but I haven't given you new diagnostics, I haven't given you new therapeutics, I haven't given you new preventative measures. And then there's probably things that I haven't thought of that you're wondering about, or maybe things that none of us have thought about and we'll have to deal with when we encounter them. So, so with that in mind, I wanted to shift gears, as I promised you earlier, and sort of take you into the future and uh, give you some perspective. And this is really, uh, you know, fast moving and, and changing, and, uh, and really my predictions about where all this is heading, and you'll see some of my predictions also include where we are investing, at least at NHGRI, and others at NIH are investing in areas. I'll tell you more than anything about the future is that the future will reflect the past. And what we've learned in the past is that technology drives this stuff more than anything. Let me just remind you some major advances that you've all seen in different areas of science. You know, the telescope really advanced astronomy profoundly. You know, clearly the microscope advanced cell biology profoundly. You know, new methods for imaging really advanced radiology profoundly. And these fancy new instruments that are giving us tools to read out genome sequences are really going to be driving us uh, technologically into the future. One way, another way, again, with the theme of looking back before we look forward, to look about genomic accomplishments we can expect for the next 20 years is think back a little bit on what it's been like over the last 20 years, and I've just walked you through some of that. But just to summarize, and this is sort of the central figure in our strategic plan, we found it was very useful from a sort of taking stock point of view to just simply reflect on where have been the genomic accomplishments across these five areas over the last 20 years, and then make a prediction about where they're going to be over the next 20 years. All hypothetical. This is just sitting down with a graphics artist and just representing it to sort of a hypothetical view. And doing this as a density plot, where each hypothetical accomplishment it gets a blue dot, and as they pile up on each other, they change colors and eventually become red. And do it across different time intervals. The Genome Project, as a starter. Where were the accomplishments in the Genome Project? It was the first domain. Uh, yeah, we learned a little bit about how genomes work, but fundamentally all the heat was in that first domain. But since the end of the Genome Project to, let's say, 2010, I think the center of gravity shifted as we launched efforts like ENCODE and others, and we 
launched efforts to get at knowledge about genomic variation. We learn more and more both about the structure of genomes, including variation, but also about how genomes work. And with that, yeah, yeah, we got some insights about disease, but basically it was the first two domains that were the, where the center of gravity sat. What about, what about now to the end of the decade? I think you're going to see it shift over so that the two most uh, progressive areas of genomics are going to be better and better understanding how the genome works, but also in particular new is really advancing our understanding about the biology of disease. Not yet advancing medical science profoundly, not yet improving healthcare. I think that's coming, um, but I'm being realistic here. We're not going to change medical science and medical practice and healthcare delivery uh, overnight or even in a decade. It's going to, but it's coming, and I'm fully confident you will see a progression rightward. But I think the real heat between now and the end of the decade is going to be in the second and the third domains in particular. So I also want to remind you that these, I sort of regard the first two domains as sort of basic genomics, technologies for studying DNA, methods for understanding how the genome works, uh, understanding human genomic variation, and so forth. That's not genomic medicine. Nor is really this middle domain where we're going to see a lot of advances this decade. I regard this as discovery. Discovering the, which variants are ones that are conferring risk or overtly causing disease. Again, that's not quite genomic medicine. We'll talk about genomic medicine uh, in a minute. It's discovery research. And what I really want to tell you about now is how are we going to create these significant advances that I'm predicting between now and the end of the decade at discovering the genomic basis of disease? Well, let me give you some flavors. It's going to involve these fancy new sequencing methods, and they are being applied on a very large scale, I can tell you. For example, we have a major program, and David Valley, when he's here, is one of our grantees. A series of new centers have been created whose goal it is is to fill in that pie chart, industrialize the process of taking these remaining disorders and using these really remarkable sequencing methods to get at the underlying defective gene. We predict we'll be able to do a significant amount of filling in this pie chart between now and the end of the decade. The program is called the Centers for Mendelian Genomics. Again, once again, named after Gregory Mendel. And if you're interested, there's a paper that describes that center and, he, and describes that program and how you can interact with those centers. Complex diseases, a big part of it. Figuring out more information about those lollipop regions, figuring out the underlying variants that sit in those regions, figuring out which ones that weren't conferring risk for disease. For that, we've, we've put our biggest centers on, the ones that have been involved in genomics on a large scale since the Genome Project. And you are seeing them tackling disorders like Alzheimer's disease, diabetes, autism, schizophrenia, and so forth. In addition, those same groups are attacking this, cancer. Of course, because cancer is a disease of the genome. In fact, it's probably the most exciting advances in clinical genomics relate to cancer, recognizing that as tumors develop, they are picking up various mutations in their genome. And of course, the same methods that we use to sequence regular old DNA can be used to sequence tumor DNA. And through efforts such as the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is the flagship effort in the United States for sequencing tumor genomes, um, we are learning a tremendous amount. Cancer Genome Atlas has picked a couple dozen types of cancer. It's now sequencing literally hundreds and hundreds of specimens and cataloging all the changes that take place um, in those cancers, making all that available, all that data available. It is one example of cancer genomics. This is going on in other countries as well. There's entire international consortiums that are set up to do this, um, and it's really greatly advancing cancer, our understanding of cancer. Um, I'm sure Elaine Martis will likely mention this. Again, in addition to being a technology expert, she's heavily involved in cancer genomics. As an aside, but to contextualize a future speaker, the same power of sequencing um, uh, human DNA can also be applied to sequencing microbes. And partially will, not directly related to understanding human genomic disease, but understanding other aspects of human disease. Efforts such as the Human Microbiome Project, the microbiome being all the organisms in various uh, communities and various locations. This is a major NIH effort. But you're going to hear from, a, uh, from Julie Segre, an intramural investigator here in June, about how these same powerful technologies of DNA sequencing are being focused on understanding infectious disease and understanding microbiome. This is an as a side, but again, it's very much in a discovery zone of understanding aspects of human disease. So that's discovery, and that's what we can expect, rare diseases, common diseases, diseases like cancer. But what about genomic medicine? Uh, genomic medicine is really these more distal domains. And uh, as you can see, it's not so much about what's going to happen this decade, 
except we want to lay a foundation for what's going to happen um, in subsequent decades. And we have an entire lecture that's dedicated uh, to genomic medicine because it really is now beginning to come into focus. And that's going to be given by Bruce Korf, who will be visiting here um, in May, and will give a lecture exclusively on genomic medicine. But what I thought I would do, just for about five or ten minutes, is to tell you my view, and I'm sure Bruce will talk about some of this, my view of what some of the hottest areas are taking place in genomic medicine, and in particular things we're doing to build that foundation this decade to help bring in the advances I predict that will start happening next decade. And there are really six hot areas I just want to briefly introduce you to, and I'm sure Bruce and others might touch on this. I just mentioned one of them, cancer genomics. This is probably the lowest hanging fruit in terms of clinical applications of genomics. And it really is one of these things that we've gotten very used to the idea of having radiographic imaging as part of a diagnostic armamentarium for, for patient care. Uh, we are not far away. In fact, we're already there for some cancers. We're routinely sequencing a tumor genome and developing maps like this, which reflect a high, sort of a high altitude view of the derangements of a given tumor's genome, will become part of a standard armamentarium for cancer diagnostics. So while today you have pathologists toiling away looking under a microscope and saying, ah, this is a breast cancer, this is a prostate cancer, et cetera, et cetera, in the future, and for some cancers that future is now, yeah, the pathologists will still look under a microscope but won't want to make all the predictions, all the diagnostic uh, details and making any sort of prognostic um, uh, predictions without having knowledge of what the derangement map looks like of that individual tumor. So again, you absolutely can expect this, and there's lots of research going on to make this a reality. And meanwhile, you hear about it. I hear this on the news. I'm not endorsing this particular group, but in particular, you're starting to hear how about genomic testing is the future cancer treatment, and they're using the word genomics. And in fact, I've predicted that for the general public, maybe the first time they understand the word genomics might be when they or a family member or friend have a cancer diagnosis, and the word genomics permeates into the discussion with the oncologist about how they're going to treat that patient. Again, not hypothetical here and now. Second area, not hypothetical here and now, big word, pharmacogenomics. Recognizing that everybody responds differently. Uh, in this case, it's to a roller coaster, but everybody responds differently to medications. And we know that CVS means well, because every medication they sell you, um, it works. It just doesn't work in everybody. And what we've learned in the past 11 years in particular is that the reason we respond differently in, for the most part, not exclusively, but for the most part for many medications is because of variants that we have in our genome that affect drug metabolism pathways and so forth. And we're learning that indeed we can figure out in advance whether you're going to be a good responder or a bad responder to a medication and use that information to guide therapy. It's such an important topic, it's the reason why we're bringing Howard McLeod here, a world expert. Um, to tell us uh, about pharmacogenomics and the latest advances to get the right drug and the right dose of that drug to the right patient. A third area um, of, of hot area represents the fact that these, you know, using genomics for medical care is not hypothetical. It really can start to be done now, but we need to get much better familiarity. We need to take this new technologies, new approaches out for a test drive. And so at NHGRI, we have a couple test drive programs, I call them where we really are, as part of a clinical research project, sequencing patients' genomes and figuring out how to do this, reduce it to practice. And you might hear more and more about our clinical sequence and exploratory research network, which consists of now about nine different groups who are studying in different settings, some in cancer, some in neonates, and so forth, testing genome sequencing as part of the routine care of patients. But meanwhile, there's some success stories. And those success stories need to be learned from, and then those successes disseminated to other sites, including diverse sites for clinical delivery of care. And so we've created another network um, called the IGNITE network, whose goal it is is to take best practices and success stories in genomic medicine and see that they get propagated to other sites as well. So again, this is not hypothetical. This really is happening in places, and we're trying to learn from it. And the FDA recognizes this is not hypothetical. This really is here and now. Uh, some of you may have seen uh, last year, uh, both through a release at the FDA and, and, and Francis Collins commented on this as well, and the leaders of both of these agencies uh, published a paper in the New England Journal. And the reason for all this flurry of activity was that the FDA has actually authorized, has cleared, in other words, one of these fancy next-generation genome sequencing platforms for clinical use. 
So again, FDA is in the middle of this because it's here and now. It's not just hypothetical. And indeed, the FDA is getting quite involved recognizing that genomics and genome sequencing is going to become part of the mainstream of clinical medicine. A fourth area, which I also think is way cool in, in one part of it and then certainly very much on people's minds, the other part, relate to, to, to newborns either or, or prenatal uh, circumstances. Um, let's deal with each of them separately and there's separate stuff going on in both. In the case of prenatal genomic analyses, very commonplace for people to, for pregnant women to get amniocentesis or getting chorionic villus sampling, a standard battery of tests are typically run for, uh, for in the prenatal setting to determine the health of that, of that unborn child, but it's pretty invasive to have amniocentesis done or chorionic villus sampling. But guess what? Those new methods for sequencing DNA are so exquisitely sensitive that they can actually get all the same information by simply detecting the fetal DNA that is floating around at very low levels in the maternal bloodstream. Again, this is not hypothetical. This is here and now. Non-invasive prenatal testing is absolutely being published in the literature right and left. It's winning awards right and left. It is one of the rages, if you will, in terms of prenatal care because it is, and there's companies forming up all around this because it is believed that amniocentesis and chorionic villus sampling will fall off precipitously because a simple blood draw of a pregnant woman will suffice using these new methods to learn the same information we were learning by getting DNA directly uh, by these more invasive methods. And in fact, even the popular press is talking about these major breakthroughs in prenatal screening as well. At the other end of that pregnancy, of course, we have newborns. And if in, here in a country like the United States, every newborn essentially is tested at a couple days with a little heel stick and a little bit of filter paper where that blood is collected, called a Guthrie, Guthrie card. Off it goes to a state lab where that, that newborn child is tested for anywhere between two and three dozen genetic diseases. But we now know the genomic basis of 5,100 rare diseases, and maybe someday we may want to get more comprehensive understanding of the health and well-being of that, of that newborn with respect to what diseases they might be susceptible to. So wow, that's going to be complicated, and think of all the ethical issues and what do you do with the information, but it might be powerful, but it also might have things we need to be cognizant of. So we partnered with the Child Health Institute and created a new program called Genome Sequencing in Newborns, or NSITE, which is now studying that, just getting out of the gates the past couple of months to now have a series of researchers study what the new world might look like with the ability to routinely sequence newborns, what are the ethical issues, what are the logistical constraints, what can you learn, is this going to be beneficial. Let's study this and, and so to pave the way towards the future, again, a program just out of the gates. And the fifth area in terms of hot topics uh, really relates, again, to a bottleneck I alluded to earlier, just understanding at a clinical level what all this genomic information really means. We don't want to end up in a circumstance where we can sequence a patient's genome routinely, but then when we go to round on that patient in the morning, we're just stuck wondering what the heck all this means, even if we just have a list of three to five million variants. We've got to empower these healthcare professionals with an easy, immediate way to look up information about the variants in that patient sitting in that bed and know what to do with it. And yet we are early days in possibly understanding exactly what to do. So it is the reason why we are looking at the, the developing clinical genomics information systems, ones that will integrate with electronic health records as they should, but also ones that will immediately deliver the kind of information that a healthcare professional will access most likely through some sort of convenient device and just tell them whether it's a physician, a nurse, a pharmacist, what they need to know about that genomic variant in that patient. So we've just launched, again, just a couple months ago, a new a program called the Clinical Genome Resource to start to develop the approaches for developing that knowledge base and figure out how to automate this because the amount of literature coming in is huge and the amount of knowledge we need to transmit um, is going to be huge. We've got to figure out ways to do this efficiently. And lastly is the use of genome sequencing to deal with ultra-rare genetic diseases, uh, something that I think is very familiar with many people right here in the NIH Clinical Center, um, and in particular with the Undiagnosed Diseases Program, which has brought a lot of uh, very goodwill to this clinical center because of the fact that it is now very straightforward and understandable that if you have a very rare, if a patient with a very rare disease, it makes a lot of sense just to sequence their genome because you've probably already done a huge workup on the person and you haven't figured out what's wrong with them. And you can just see review article after review article after review articles describing how people around the world are doing this. Because just sequencing it as part of a diagnostic test 
as part of a very long diagnostic odyssey just makes a lot of sense. You don't always figure out what's wrong with that patient, but boy, you, enough of the times do that it makes it worthwhile. That is the reason why NIH is expanding the undiagnosed diseases program, which started right here in the clinical center and is now developing a national network of these centers. It's going to build upon the successful experience of the program here intramurally to improve the diagnosis of care of patients with undiagnosed diseases, facilitate research into the etiology of undiagnosed diseases, and create a highly collaborative research community to identify best practices for the diagnosis and management of undiagnosed diseases. And just later this year, we'll be announcing a series of new sites that are going to be set up around the country that will interact with here at the NIH Clinical Center, its undiagnosed disease program, to now create a larger catchment system and to really scale, if you will, uh, this uh, ability to go from a very rare disease to, to try to help that patient uh, that it will include, in most cases, uh, genome sequencing. So that's most of what I wanted to tell you. And I hope what I've done in many ways, taking you over the last 25 years in describing this landscape, is also convince you that the relevance of genomics has changed a lot in that quarter century. You know, when I got involved on day one of the Genome Project, or even year minus one, of the, when I first got involved in genomics, you know, genomics was really about biomedical researchers in laboratories, at computers, toiling away. Um, but it was, it was research. But, you know, since the Genome Project ended, increasingly we've engaged our healthcare professional partners, and they've recognized that the future is going to be genomic medicine, and they've gotten involved in this, um, and they've gotten much more aware of genomics. I see the big phase change now happening this decade, and in particular next decade, is that genomics is going to become relevant to patients, and therefore friends and relatives of patients, it's all of us, because we're all going to know somebody who has cancer, we're all going to know somebody who's going to have one of the disorders I've talked about, and as a result, though, even the word genomics is going to become very relevant to us. And so we think a lot about that as part of the responsibility of the field of genomics is to recognize that this has gone from a scientific to a biomedical to now a societal discipline in many ways. And we very much embrace the idea of thinking about the societal implications of genomics research. Um, some of you may have heard about our ethical, legal, social implications research program, which has been ongoing since the beginning of the Genome Project and continues to thrive at our institute. But even broader than that, we think a lot about some of the public health considerations, some of the educational issues a lot about genomic literacy and so forth. Uh, when Colleen McBride comes here in April to give a lecture, she'll be talking about public health implications of genomics, which again is cast around some of these issues, thinking more broadly about genomics and society. Last, the second to last thing I wanted to tell you, though, is we're very interested in, in literacy around genomics, in particular public literacy, thinking about the patient who will have to encounter genomic information about themselves or their loved ones. And we're doing various things, but I just I have, to, I have to put in a plug because it's way cool and I'm particularly proud of it and because you're here in D.C. area, is that one of the things that we've done, and this came out last year, was to create, to partner with the Smithsonian Institution to create a public exhibition about genomics and have it um, be at the, the National Museum of Natural History right here in the D.C. Mall. Um, if you're not familiar with this or haven't heard about it, it's this, this, this exhibition called Genome Unlocking Life's Code a partnership between these two great institutions. Um, it opened in June, um, and uh, it's going to be here till September. So I want to tell you about it, because I would convince you to please go see it before it leaves for the D.C. area in December. Um, if you need to find it, it's really easy to find. You just go to the Hope Diamond on the second floor of the museum, and you take a left. And we're in the hall immediately adjacent. Now, if that doesn't work, just remember how many human chromosomes are there, how many pairs of human chromosomes, 23 pairs of human chromosomes, and it's in Hall 23, so that's the other easy way to remember it. If you get there, you, and you get there tomorrow, you'll, well, or whenever you get there, so far you will follow what have now been about 1.6 million people who have visited the exhibition um, uh, since uh, June. But, and, and if you get there before September, you'll be what we expect to be over 3 million people who will visit it. When it leaves here in September, it then tours around North America for about four to five years, including Canada. Um, and so you can go visit another city as well, but it's easy just to jump on the metro and go, go see it before it leaves. And if you want to read more about the exhibition and a lot of affiliated um, programming information on educational material, this is its dedicated website, unlockinglifescode.org. And the last plug, and then I really will be done, last plug I would say is that I have come to realize that, that with the fast pace of genomics and lots of new stuff, and in fact that whole last section, I just went through with you is all stuff that some of, it, some of those programs just started the past few months. 
I am told that so much happens in genomics, including coming out of our institute, that people find that they love to get updated. And so I was convinced by especially advisors to try to develop a way to communicate uh, what's going on at the institute. If you're interested in getting updates about what's happening, I now put out a monthly uh, newsletter. If you just go to that URL and follow the links, you can subscribe to it. And you don't have to, you don't, but I'm just saying, if you're interested in a little two-pager about once a month, it comes out at the beginning of every month, please feel free to subscribe to this. And every one of the new programs I was just talking about had been featured in the last few months um, in that monthly uh, newsletter. So um, I will stop there. I think in the interest of time, and I have used the time, I will just end and thank you for your attention. And rather than taking questions, I'll just stick around the podium and anybody can come down and talk to me individually. Thank you very much.